I'm an independent investigative journalist. Um, I uh, work on issues of national security, quote unquote. I started doing this in 2004 um, because of Iraq. I uh, started writing about Iraq as an independent journalist in 2004. And it immediately, not immediately, but soon occurred to me that um, what I was doing was investigative journalism. So, so that's really what I've consciously tried to strive for since then. I do analysis, sort of investigative analysis, as well as investigative journalism in the, in the straight sense. And, um, and I've covered Iraq, I've covered Afghanistan, I've covered Pakistan, drones, and, um, and now the Iranian nuclear program. Those have been my major, uh, major stories that I've covered. Um, I was previously a Southeast Asia specialist. I wrote a book on how we got involved in Vietnam, which is really what radicalized me and caused me to understand that the problem is not just a JFK or an LBJ or a George Bush or an Obama. The problem is a war system, a permanent war state, which we've had since the beginning of the Cold War and has never shut down, of course, for obvious reasons. And it's not going to shut down until you know it, it encounters overwhelming political opposition or runs out of money, whichever comes first. I have a feeling it's going to be running out of money first, but anyway. So that has been the framework within which I've really been looking at all these issues since then. What your investigations, is there one investigation that sticks out to you the most, that, that is one of the you know, biggest stories that you worked on? What is that one well, it's story this, that's it's, most important? It's the Iran nuclear program and the, and the falsification of not just the history, but really the documents which have been used to indict Iran as not just some a country that wants nuclear weapons, but has it covertly been pursuing nuclear weapons. Um, and I've shown in my book that the story of where the documents came from has been covered up. And I'll tell you where they did come from. The book is out now. It's public information. Uh, it was the Mujahideen e Calc which turned the documents over. These are the documents that were supposedly from the laptop uh, computer of a scientist or engineer who was part of this alleged program, purported program. Uh, they actually were turned over by the Mujahideen Calc to Western intelligence. The BND, the German intelligence agency, was the one that they were turned over to. They turned it over to the United States. And BND, this was a, a, a sometime source that they had gotten it from, this, this uh, MEK guy. And they then realized that the United States was going to use these for political purposes to position themselves for potential war against Iran. And so they didn't like this. Yeah. It was curveball all over again. And so, uh, literally, they, they went to the United States, they, they used this foreign service officer, the German foreign service officer, who I interviewed after he retired, and it's in the book, who, who talked about the fact that they were worried about another curveball situation. Because curveball was one of the BND's sources. And they decided, after debriefing him a number of times, he couldn't be believed. And they warned the, the CIA, George Tenet, the head of the CIA, don't rely on him. Of course, Tenet didn't pay any attention to them because they wanted their war. Yeah, they had the news that they wanted to promote to get exactly. out there and promote the war. So they saw this happening over again, yeah. and they put out the word through this German Foreign Service officer that the United States should not depend on these documents. And he actually warned in November 2004 to the Wall Street Journal. And again, of course, nobody paid any attention to it. And they still used it to justify their push against Iran. They still used there's it. No major, there's no major uh, fix, there's no major explanation. To and, and when they began to use it in 2005, giving it to the IEEA, they did intend to certainly keep the military option open. That was always the intention yeah. with so they, the Bush administration. Much, you know, known, knownly used evidence 
that was discredited from a war and never even fixed the problem. And that's the story that you broke. It's history repeating itself. Just like WMDs. Exactly. Are you familiar with the USS Liberty incident? No. Of course. Yeah. Do, you, could you, do you foresee anything similar, false flag type attack being perpetrated by either someone in the American war machine or Israel well, I, or I have been justification? In the past, I have been, shall we say, concerned about that issue, about that possibility. But in doing my book, one of the things that I found out He's like really, I found this out before I actually started writing the book, but once I got into focusing on the Iran nuclear program, what I found out was that the threat of a war by Israel against Iran has always been fake. There's never been anything to it. It's always been a political ploy by the Israelis, starting in the early 1990s, actually, uh, but particularly in the late 1990s. Um, and they used this basically to try to scare the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Europeans into doing something drastic against Iran. Oh, if you don't do something about Iran, we might have to just attack Iran. And so the Israelis never intended to attack. And now, God of course, forbid, right? false flag attack, it's always a possibility, but it's highly risky. And uh, because of the fact that the Israeli threat of war is so completely empty, I do have doubts that that, that would... I, I think that both Mossad and the IDF are so opposed to confrontation with Iran that they would not agree to do this. And one of the things in my book that shows how sharp the contradiction is between Bibi Netanyahu and the security uh, agencies, both Mossad and uh, the IDF, is an incident that took place in 2010, which we now know about because there's an Israeli program about it, where uh, Netanyahu ordered the IDF to go on the highest alert possible, which is the alert that goes with being preparing to go to war. He never intended to do it, and that came out in the program, but he was going to try to scare the Americans into doing that. And the IDF, the, the head of the IDF, said, no, I'm not going to do that. Are you crazy? Yeah. And, and he didn't. Yeah. And he, he basically got them to back down. Wow. <laughs> you know, we're asking these questions because we saw that the Downing Street memos came out when Blair and Bush were talking. They were talking about having a plane fly over I Iran, have it shot down, and have it blame like the Iranians just shot down one of our airplanes when they were going to paint it differently and then use that as a justification for war with Iran. But it seems like their plan hasn't worked. We know Wesley Clark talked about the seven year, you know, the 10 year plan with seven countries. It's the, it's, it's somewhat coming true, it's somewhat not. No, no, what that, that, fell apart, you, yeah. that fell apart when Iran, uh, excuse me, when Iraq yeah. went sour. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was the whole, the whole plan was based on the idea that they were just going to quickly take care of Iraq. They would take it over, essentially use it as a military base for, to put pressure, go after all the other countries, not necessarily using military force, but in the case of Iran, they figured they probably would have to use military force. But we still see the same pressures and the same pushes towards war with Iran. You see that now, and Syria as well, because they were a part of the two out of the seven countries that they wanted to right. push. So they're still pushing uh, with uh, the PR well, the propaganda machine. That yeah. was the neocons. neocons. And the, the military uh, never wanted war against Iran. They were always against it. Yes, yes. Uh, course, and yes. they were against any war in Syria because that meant war in Iran too. Yes, so yes, yes. bear that in mind. Of course, yeah. and then Russia also got involved. But yeah. you still see the push by the U.S. propaganda mainstream media and by the top officials of this government to still try to interject into Syria, to still try to uh, drum up the beach for war with Iran. we have multiple sources yeah. of warmongering in this country. Of course. We have the pro-Israeli lobby. We have in certain instances where it serves the purposes of the military, the whole military industrial complex. And then you've got sort of the freebooters, you know, sort of humanitarian warmongers, yeah. <laughs> you know, the people, liberals, essentially, who have nothing better to do with their lives. And this is kind of what gives that meaning, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, and the news media is caught in between these three streams. Uh, and never says no to somebody in power. Exactly. And therefore, that's why you get a news media that is so overwhelmingly pro-war, no matter who proposes it. Yes, they have to push and, the and in some cases, as in the case of Iran, 
the news media tend to be more hawkish than the government. Yeah. And they have to also push the propaganda to get the access, because if they don't, they don't get the access. Where do you see it going? Because you still see forces pushing for it, uh, but you see things, important things happening, like the stop in Syria, like Romani coming in. You see key things happening that are putting a stop to the war plan, but you still see it push. So where do you see it going? Well, I mean, first of all, they have no idea what they're going to do. They meaning the White House and the administration, the uh, the people who make war, uh, national security decisions, they, they have no idea what they're going to do. Uh, they don't know what they're going to do about Syria. They don't know what they're going to do about Iran. They, have, they don't know what their negotiating position is going to be on Iran. Uh, they have very outrageously optimistic notions of what they can wring out of Iran, and I think that's very dangerous. So that situation is by no means resolved. Yeah. There's still a grave danger that of miscalculation of getting into uh, a confrontation with Iran over that. And, and still, you know, the military will not go to war against Iran consciously, certainly. And so I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, I don't know how Syria is going to play out because you've got forces in the Middle East who are supporting the jihadists. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, you've got the, the wider Sunni Shia violent confrontation that's growing rather than receding in the Middle East. Extre extremely dangerous situation. The United States doesn't know what to do about that either. So what is the book and uh, where can people buy it? The book is called Manufactured Crisis, the untold story of the Iran nuclear scare. And it's on sale at Amazon.com. And from the publisher, Just World Books. Um, so you can go online either place to get it. Thank you so much for breaking the story. It's great to talk to you. Investigative journalist. I think we're getting a lot of our men killed for nothing. They're fighting on a something that's not a worthy cause. People need to not rise up in arms, but to take... See him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, 